Hey, welcome back, listeners. Uh, I know we've been knocking these episodes out uh, without much lapse, which is great. Um, but we wanted to uh, have a very kind of special show. I know we've talked a lot in the past about the election. We've talked about COVID. But it's just sort of the uh, uh, the, the sort of, um, you know, ruminations of me and Omar, who by no means are experts. But this time, we are joined by a very special guest who is an expert in this field. Uh, and so he is a political consultant. And so Omer, why don't you tell us who we have on the show? And we are super excited to uh, welcome our guest to the show. Uh, absolutely. And we are T minus 12 days from the election and honored to have Mustafa Tamiz on the show. Mustafa is outreach strategist, founder, and president. He began his career in New York advertising for corporate clients, but after moving to Texas, he shifted to advising su- successful campaigns for state legislators, mayors, members of Congress, and public institutions. Mustafa is a national opinion leader with over 600 appearances on CNN, Fox News, MSNBC, and CBS News. The Atlantic names him as a top Democratic consultant in Texas, and Texas Monthly refers him as one of the top Democrats to watch. Mustafa is the chairman of the Transportation Advocacy Group Board, a director of the Texas Lyceum, um, a member of the Unity National Bank Board, among other civic and business affiliations. He's also provided extensive consulting for the Department of Homeland Security. And uh, Mustafa, welcome to the show. You'll have to educate me on the pronunciation of Lyceum. (laughs) Uh Lyceum, Texas Lyceum. Okay, got it. So welcome. Uh, we are 12 days away from the election. There's a there's a debate tonight. You must be very busy. Yeah, it's, a, you know, almost 50 million Americans have already voted. Uh, and as you approach election day, you know, by the time we reach election day, almost 75 percent of voters have already voted. So the election is a season more than it's a day. Uh, and and this uh, this particular election cycle, people are really taking advantage of it across the country. We've seen record turnouts, and so yes, all of us are are enthralled with it and are busy with it. Uh, and it's an exciting time uh, to be a voter. And as a Democrat, if if uh, um, I, that's uh, that's that's the uh, understanding I have of, of uh, your background and your take, um, early voting is a good thing, correct? Uh, voting as a whole is a good thing. I mean, I think that I'm in Texas. Uh, we became a majority minority state uh, in 2004, 16 years ago. Uh, but the, the 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 our representation, whether it's in Congress or the state house or uh, at a state level, is not reflective of the state's population. And that's because Texas is not a Republican state or a Democratic state. For years, Texas has been a non-voting state. And as our voter participation goes up uh, in this cycle, you're going to start seeing the, the the faces and the backgrounds of those that we elect mirror more of the population of Texas. And as, as we see that across the country. Yeah, one of the things that we that, that, that I know at least a couple of weeks ago was kind of a new story was um, – uh, the like Governor Abbott kind of restricting uh, where people could, I think, uh, drop off mail in ballots. Right. I think it was sort of like Harris County had the same number as any smaller county in West Texas somewhere. So has that has that improved any? Well, you know, he, he has made that decision. And, and because of it, it, it again, it's, it's an attempt to create chaos. It's an attempt to make it harder for people to vote. Mm-hmm. Uh, right now, we, we, the, just like while we're on, uh, the Texas Supreme Court just ruled that we can have drive-through voting uh, in Harris County. This was a, a, a for contention, and, and literally just as I was getting on, the court just ruled, um, which is really important in that if you make voting easier for people, if you give people multiple options to vote, uh, you see the turnout go up, and that's what we've seen in Harris County. Uh, Turnout's going up everywhere around the country, including in Texas, but especially in Harris County, because we Harris County uh, has become a Democratic county as of the last election cycle. And because of that, the leadership that's there uh, wants to be inclusive, wants to hear the voices of people that live in this county uh, and made many things easier, including having a drive through voting. Like if you can drive through and do a, a, a banking transaction, if you can drive through and, and order the, the best fast food 
uh, which we have in Texas because we have Whataburger, right? Uh, <laughs> and yeah. We should be able to vote. Um, and, uh, and, and I think that that's an important thing. You know, the, this cycle, one of the, one of the things is so with COVID-19, uh, people were given uh, a test uh, for COVID-19, a blood test, while they were in their cars. So we can do all of that. Why can't we go? <laughs> that's that that's that was me that was me i i had to i had i took the I took, my second test was a drive through test and uh they gave me a little package and um i had to uh test myself and also test my daughter uh she she wasn't too happy with me afterwards and drop it back off just like i would have you know an envelope at the bank or what have you so you're absolutely right so without being cynical, or maybe there is no way to be or or to, to talk about this without sort of looking at it cynically but what is the impetus for Republicans to try to limit um, voter turnout? Like, what, what what's the aggregate advantage to Republicans by limiting voter turnout? Well, I'll use Texas as an example because it's easier for me and I think it's easier to understand. Um, as I said earlier, Texas became a majority-minority state in 2004. What Texas looks like today is what the country will look like in 2044. So the, the demography of Texas will, will be the demography of this nation. And as voters become more diverse, uh, uh, they want more inclusive leadership. And the Republican Party, especially under President Trump, uh, is no longer an inclusive party. Um, you know, you have people that are espousing uh, white nationalists, uh, not just sentiment, not just rhetoric, uh, but even claiming themselves to to be a white nationalist, supporting the Republican Party, and the president will not deny will not denounce them. Uh, and so the Republican primary has become a very shrinking pool uh, of mostly white voters, uh, and it's a sad thing because you know we're a I mean, I'm a partisan, I'm a Democrat, uh, but this country functions because we're, we're a two party uh, system, and if so, one of the parties becomes fringe, that's not good for the system. I mean, I, I work for Democrats to be elected. Uh, um, I'm a partisan, uh, but I have respect for the Republican Party. And what we're seeing today is not the Republican Party uh, that I've seen growing up. And it's not certainly the Republican Party of Ronald Reagan, uh, uh, you know, who embraced immigrants, uh, who uh, was the first one to to say that this country is better because of immigrants. And now you are, you know, fast forward to the Donald Trump Republican Party where President Trump has gotten elected uh, by saying Mexicans are uh, criminals and rapists as, as, as opening salve to his campaign. So this is not the same Republican Party that, that really any of us can recognize. And you see so many Republicans uh, from various different backgrounds, whether uh, it's from the military who tended not to be partisan, not to make partisan remarks, national security apparatus, or or just senior statesmen that have just come out openly against President Trump and, and, and are endorsing Joe Biden uh, uh, to win the next presidency. You had the New England School of Medicine or Journal of Medicine uh, for the first time ever endorse a candidate. And that was, of course, Joe Biden. Um, but anyway, yeah, uh, you know, it, it's it's interesting. I mean, I, I think if I could play devil's advocate, you know, a let's say a Trump supporter who doesn't support his sort of racist uh, language um, would argue that, well, I, I voted Trump because he's a populist. And, you know, the party, the Republican Party of Reagan or Bush represents the quote unquote establishment. And this is certainly an argument you hear among even Biden supporters, or let's say people who are anticipating or will be voting Biden, but aren't enthused as they would be, say, if it was Bernie Sanders at the top. So, you know, that, that hey, we didn't want to vote for a quote unquote establishment candidate. So what, what would be your response to that in terms of like, if we look at what happened in 2016, you know, taking aside white resentment, could there be an argument that there was this sort of attraction to Trump's populist message, populist message, sorry? You know, I think it, it's somewhat of a red herring, right? Like it, Around the world, there are more and more populist movements, right? And it, a lot of it is due uh, 
you know, all of us carry a phone now and we're, we're connected with people around the world. Something happens in a different part of the world. We know right away. We saw the video right away. It, it drives our emotion. So this connectivity creates that sense of populism. And as we've seen this populism, populism uh, rise up around the world, we've also seen authoritarianism rise up around the world, right? So, you know, whether it's India or whether it's uh, Donald Trump here in the United States or whether it's Turkey, uh, authoritarianism is, uh, is in full mode while people are saying we're becoming more and more populist, right? So it's a, it, it, you know, there, while there's a need for people uh, and while the divide amongst the rich and poor, while the divide of information and education is prevalent, um, we also have to understand that when you're saying, when people say, I don't want establishment, they're saying, I don't want more of the same. Mm-hmm. What, what they necessarily they don't want is inexperienced, immature leadership that doesn't understand how to manage the coronavirus because in essence if if you're not been in government if you're not been in 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 politics and you come from the outside it's kind of like saying i want to run the biggest auto company in the world i have no experience in ever you know building a car it doesn't work yeah so you know it's interesting You're, you're talking about um kind of the populism aspect of it um as somebody who went to a Catholic college, and I have a lot of uh, conservative friends. To them, and or at least to some of them, this isn't across the board, but to some of them, it's a matter of secularism versus um, secularism, and almost they what they call anti-religion or anti-Christianity versus protecting protecting what they believe in, right? And I'm curious what your thoughts are on um, what the Democratic Party can do to. Um, erase those those concerns. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of believers in the Democratic Party, but do you give up on those believers who are saying, hey, the Democratic Party's anti-Christian has an agenda against us? Look, I think that is a Republican frame. Republicans have, very, have been very good since the 60s to try to brand uh, and take ownership of religion, yet not follow those Christian ideals um, um, in a meaningful way. And, and, and Trump is just a, a symptom, right? Like no matter what Donald Trump did, the, the religious right supported him. Uh, so what happened to all those values when it came to Donald Trump and, and many other candidates? And, and in a sense, when people say, well, Democrats are, are more secular, well, I mean, we, we are a, we are a, 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 a nation, uh, uh, of, um, the faithful, right, in, in many different faiths. It's, a, it, it's the Abrahamic faiths that make up this country, uh, and it's far more devout than Europe. Uh, we, we've always been that. And this country is, I would say, the United States is more conservative than Europe and other places. And I don't think there's, and I, and that's why I'm here. I mean, this is, this is the place where um, somewhat a person of faith is respected. Uh, and you can go to many countries around the world, especially in Europe, it, you know, that's not the case. Uh, but you should be able to practice your faith, whatever your faith is, and the government should not be able to interfere with that. And that's why you need that, that ability to be able to, uh, to, to you know, practice your faith. But you need secularism in order for no one else to tell you what your faith should be and how you should tract- practice your faith. And so if you look at the... If you look at the two parties, uh, you will find that Democrats will champion for people's faith, but, but they will also push back against faith getting the way of, of the governance. That if you walked into a courthouse, that it should not be any one person's faith that trumps another person's faith, right? If you walked in to get you know services from your local you know municipality, someone shouldn't shouldn't hold your faith against you. Right. And, and so, you know, when you pick up our currency in God, we trust. Right. And so in every part of American society, whether it's from the establishment or not, uh, faith is underscored and it's celebrated. Uh, what the Republican Party has done has tried to make everything into a grievance uh, uh, and, a, and a victim frame. You know, it's like... Um, you know, we, why can't we celebrate Christmas campaigns, right? 
uh, and you go, I, we celebrate Christmas. Uh, there's a tree. I grew up in New York, and I love going to, uh, um, uh, you know, seeing the, the, the giant Christmas tree, um, you know, and ice skate around it. Um, uh, you know, I know I'm practicing Muslim, and my family was, but we never – Christmas was a happy time in New York. It's the only time we can get in the in the train and bump against somebody, and they won't bump you back because New Yorkers are happier during Christmas. Uh, <laughs> it, it, you know, so I don't. So I think a lot of this conversation uh, comes from very well thought out, very deep, astute Republican messaging machine uh, that is dominant. Republicans also talk about that. You know, the, the media has a, a, a liberal bias sense. The number one cable station in the United States is Fox News. The number one affiliates around the country for local news is Fox News. I, I'm on Fox News quite often. Uh, the number two circulation newspaper is Wall Street Journal. Uh, I've never seen those things to be liberal in any way, but yet there, there seems to be a message machine that says uh, there's a liberal bias in media. Well, um, the conservative media is far more potent, far more powerful, uh, far more uh, likely to side with the president regardless of what he does. Uh, yet people say, "Ah, oh, it's liberal media." Oh, uh, Democrats don't uh, don't respect faith. Um, I don't know. I, I've, I've been a lot in a lot of churches in my life doing politics uh, and, and 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 serving in interfaith capacity. You'll find the people that that have the most faith care about the vulnerable care about the poor and though in, in all Abrahamic faith, in all faith, those are things that are that are upheld high. And in no other political party within this country, the the desire to help the poor exists more than the Democratic Party. Yeah, you know, um, it's really interesting you're talking about narratives that the Republican Party has been using. Um, and, uh, and we're, we can talk a little more about your, your, your predictions for what happens after the election as well, but it's going to be really interesting to see how the, the narratives are, they'll have to be rewritten, especially if Trump loses, right. And how that, <clears throat> how they pick themselves up from the ashes. Of course, if, if things go differently, uh, and Trump wins, then it's a whole different story. Yeah. Look. Well, I mean, what, but I mean, you know, the thing is I, I've been hearing that kind of like, well, you know, this loss is going to um, sort of, uh, uh, you know, lead to the Republican Party having a moment of introspection. And we, and I heard that back in, I heard that back when it was McCain and Obama. I heard that back with Romney and Obama. Like, I, I don't know. Like, I, I almost want to say that is the Republican Party truly capable of a level of introspection? Um, you know, because what leads to a, like, maybe we could talk a little bit about what, what sort of led up to, you know, I know he lost the popular, pop, popular, popular vote, but nonetheless, I mean, you had a, you know, um, you know, a, a sizable enough of a, a chunk of the country that voted Trump. Like what, you know, what do you attribute to a candidate, like to the candidacy of a, of, of a candidate like Trump and then the eventual presidency of a candidate like Trump? Well, look, I mean, the candidacy of Donald Trump is not that unique from a global perspective. Good point. You, you can go across the world. Um, let's, 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 let's not spend time in Europe because Europe and the United States have a lot in common. And you touched on that. I think, I think, yeah. So maybe just kind of bringing it specifically to, yeah. you know, yeah. In, the United in, States. In, in Europe, you, you know, you have candidates, uh, party leaders like president Trump that, you know, in, in places like, uh, France, uh, Germany, um, Denmark, these very right-wing conservative parties range anywhere from 12 to 18 percent in support. Uh, not that different here in the United States. But if you look at the hardcore supporter of, of, of President Trump, it's around that same number, maybe 20, 25, you know, on the, on the high end. So it's not that much difference. But when a two-party system, right, uh, it's almost like there's a winner-take-all scenario that in a multi-party system, that person that gets 12 to 18 percent has to then build a coalition with other parties, right? So whether it's in Israel, whether it's in Europe, you know, where, where you have parliamentary governments, 
um, you have that happen. And Boris Johnson, yeah, yeah Boris Johnson, right. So it's like in that sense, there is always there is always that wing um, in Western industrial nations and really in, in, in all places that there is a, always a conservative part, right? Um, what's happened with President Trump is that. Uh, we really have started to understand the power of the primaries. In the Republican primary, uh, whoever wins that Republican primary uh, is not representing the majority of the Republican Party voters in the general election. They're basically a product of very active, very engaged uh, minority of the Republican Party that votes in primary elections. Same thing on the Democratic side. On the Democratic side, so it's not necessarily that different. What's happened in the Republican Party, uh, you know, that there used to be an outside interest group during Ronald Reagan's era of, of the Christian Coalition, and Ronald Reagan made a number of speeches and kind of brought that movement into the Republican Party establishment and the grassroots level. And over the years, that grassroots movement grew during President Obama, it, it, it took its height and really was kind of that Tea Party movement. Uh, and they they really uh, occupy a significant space amongst the Republican primary voters. They, they tend to be Anglo, uh, and I think a lot of times people use the word conservative in very broad terms. Right, the conservatism is, has a lot of different meanings, uh, uh, but these are very socially conservative voters, uh, and they bring with them a nostalgia of what they believe America used to be in the 50s, you know, that it was more monolithic, it wasn't as diverse, that uh, the values of the 1950s uh, in a conservative type of, you know, mom and dad, women having a, a particular role in society, you know, they have a preference to that role. And so you find that in, in even our conservative society, it's, it's, a, it's kind of like a, uh, you know, it cuts across faith, mm -hmm. but in in the political terms, you bring that movement up against the first woman running for the presidency of the United States, who's who has very low popularity numbers to begin with, right? Uh, and then you add to it a a populist uh, um, branding uh, person like Donald Trump. Uh, you know, who uh, just has always been divisive in nature mm -hmm. uh, together. And he won by the narrowest margin in American, you know, politics, right? It was 71,000 votes that he won the presidency by, even though he lost a popular vote by over three and a half million, the 71 populist vote in some key states is where uh, they were able to do this. And so uh, when you asked earlier, Say why are why is there an effort to prevent people from voting? Uh, why are why are all these obstacles set up in front of voters? Well, that's why because when few people vote, when you when you disenfranchise black and brown voters, it's advantageous to a party that doesn't right now doesn't even try to court black and brown voters. Tries to manipulate it. Tries to you know, throw some red herrings in there, you know, but for the most part is, is not really trying to address the issues and trying to court them in a meaningful way. Uh, so you, you know, that's what we end up with, right? So it has I to mean, the, like, would you say that Candace Owens, notwithstanding, you know, of, of, who are trying to court black voters or trying to get them to jump ship from the Democratic Party? Look, I mean, I think it's, you know, politics is a team sport, right? They're a Republican Party, they're, it's a team sport. But I think the state that we we're in right now, the state of the Republican Party, is not recognizable. It's not about courting people's vote. It's about finding ways to, to uh, you know, stack the courts in their favor because they're losing uh, elections, right? Uh, the Civil Rights Act uh, and the Civil Rights Movement won through the court system. Yeah. So they're trying to reverse that and say, all right, well, if, if 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 more people were franchised by the court system, then if we want to you know if we want to defranchise them, then let's go back to the court system and stack it against them. Yeah, so it's 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 really a uh, a way uh, it, it, something that just we just have not seen in liberal democracies around the world. Mm. And I think that people of faith 
are really important at this juncture because politics always tries to uh, manipulate people uh, through different lenses, and faith is one big one because that's how people align. So it's easier to say, I'm not with this party because look at these three things that are not in my faith, right? Rather than trying to see the bigger picture of what is your interest, what, you know, what is your worldview? Um, and, and you know, you know if, if there is a, a space where manipulation occurs, uh, it, it occurs in, in, in the faith tradition. And, and mm-hmm. it could be done for um, healing people and bringing people together, and it could be used for divisiveness. And throughout history, we've seen we've seen that. elements of that. Yeah. And, and, and just real quick, you talked about voter suppression um, leading up to the election. So in this case, in the case of Trump, it's not only doing uh, that leading up to the election, but election day and post-election day, there's a risk of um, questioning the results, right? And that's that's almost even more scary. You know, what we've never seen before is someone engaged in the highest office in the land has part of his strategy on how to challenge the election. You've never seen that, right? Never seen somebody run and win an election and say the election was rigged. I mean, after the 2016 election, the only thing you can find President Trump say was the election was rigged. And you go, oh, you yeah. won. <laughs> it doesn't mean yeah. rigged. You won. How does, how does this all come together, right? You keep saying it's rigged. Because in a way, uh, he does have some clear understanding that this was just, this happened a little bit out of the fluke. And so we don't, we want to basically keep perpetuating and, and mistrust of this. And so within the, the President Trump's campaign, um, there are people and organizational structure uh, that's been funded and working just as hard as the persuasion campaign to actually file lawsuits and injunctions and thwart the, the, the will of the voters. Yeah. Well, so... Well, I have a lot. Of, there's so many questions that come to mind. But one of the things that I've often that that's perplexed me, let's put it that way, is is the um, is is how easily the Republican Party has sort of fallen in line with what Trump's agenda is. Right? I mean, like even in the twenty, like in terms of the 2020 convention, like you know, the Republican Party had no had no platform. Their platform was essentially Trump. So how did Trumpism, as it as, as it were, come to sort of usurp the entire Republic, the entire the entire Republican Party? Excuse me. Well, I think again, coming back to what we were talking about earlier, like this is a global phenomenon. It's not just in the United States, right? As people feel uh, frightened and threatened by change, uh, they cling more to that authoritarianism, and it's it, it's like that guy is a bad guy, but he's my guy. Mm-hmm. Right. This leader is, you know, I know he, he, he always says, says these things, but he's good for me and my interest. Right. And and that sentiment has, is, is a global phenomenon um, and liberal democracy are threatened everywhere by it. Mm-hmm. There is a, you know, people genuinely, you know, on the one hand, if you look at the numbers prior to COVID, at no point in history were we more at peace. Right, more prosperity than any other time uh, in in the world history. Right, like just just sheer numbers. Right, there was projections prior to COVID that within the decade, maybe decade and a half, we can eliminate world hunger because there was just we know how to grow the amount of food that we need. We just have a distribution issue. Right, how do we get it to people in in, in a meaningful way? So, uh, you know, uh, you know, twenty five years ago, you know, you had. Um, uh, you, 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 various wars where we just lost so many lives, right? Mm-hmm. And then right now, the even though like the the you know if you look at the Vietnam War and you look at the two longest wars, Afghanistan and Iraq, just in terms of American casualties, five thousand versus fifty thousand Vietnam War. You go twenty five years before then, World War Two, you know the casualties and World War One, the casualties are off the chart, right? So if you just look at an aggregate just sheer numbers, the world was more at peace. Uh, world was freer and 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 you know was more prosperous. Yet people felt 
that the world was in chaos. And a lot of, and if you, and if you just looked at uh, the iPhone was invented in 2007, iPad in 2010. If you look at the prescription rate of uh, antidepressants and mm. uh, uh, and others, you will see there's a, it began to spike up starting in 2007 and just kept on going up and up and up and up, right? Because as we're more interconnected, our emotions are interconnected to each other. So when people see something, they feel it right away. In the past, it used to be that, you know, if something happened across the world, you would at best maybe read the newspaper the next day and maybe see a picture at best. Now if something happens across the world, you're seeing video in real time. Mm-hmm. So it's just like any news, right? That social media feed is no different than any news cycle. When you watch your six o'clock, 10 o'clock news, if Bobby had a birthday, nobody cares. Bobby would shot on his birthday. Cameras are there and you're going to see it in, you know, in full color, right? So right. in essence, the, the negative elements of life have just penetrated into our psyche, making us anxious, making us more nervous, wanting, you know, the desire to have somebody that looks like us, somebody who's going to represent our, in authority and in power. And that's right. what happened. Yeah, yeah. And, and then where people were getting their information from became more tribal, you know. And so, yeah, it just sort of created those uh, hermetically sealed sort of echo chambers that people can 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 surround themselves with and in. Yeah, because on the one hand, having people like minded to you is comforting, right? It's comforting. But it also is that bunker mentality. That I only trust the people that are like me. I don't trust anybody else. And then that's a, and that's why I think that people of faith, of all faith, especially in our community, are incredibly important, and their leadership is incredibly important right now. Yeah. So thank you so much, uh, Mustafa, for that, and, and and kind of giving us kind of how we we've, we've arrived at this moment, as it were, kind of a nice little primer. I, I guess wanting to talk more about the present, and then you know, sort of what the future looks like. Um, what are you seeing right now? Like in terms of, uh, you know, like Omar mentioned, we're 12 days away from the election. Um, we, we are, uh, recording the day of, uh, the second and final presidential debate. So what are you seeing right now in the polls? Um, and, 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 and a lot of people are a little reticent and reluctant to sort of look at the polling because of what happened in 2016. So if you could not only kind of tell us what you're seeing in the polling here right now, but also why 2016 may have been the outlier and not necessarily uh, sort of something that we need to, you know, uh, constantly be cautious of. Yeah, there's a 2016 P- PTSD, right? Because nobody wants to go out. Yeah, and thank you. Oh my God, this is what's going to happen, right? But if you, if you, th- this is the most durable lead that any presidential candidates had since, um, you know, Bill Clinton and, and Bob Dole, right? I mean, this is since 1996. This is the most durable long-term lead since Biden's announced. He's been somewhere between you know nine points and 16 point lead over Trump. Fairly consistently, never dropped, uh, and so I think that the floor and the ceiling for President Trump is well established. You know that floors in the late thirties, the ceiling is potentially in the early forties, right? And so from that vantage point, um, you know President Trump, um, you know, drew a straight flush. Uh, for playing cards in, in, in winning his election last time by just barely just making it, you know, in Pennsylvania, um, in Wisconsin, and in uh, Michigan. Those are the three states where he got 71,000 more votes out of them, mostly in Pennsylvania, yeah. uh, and he won his election. So in order for him to win again, right, would mean that he has to do exactly what he did and maybe a little bit better. Right. And what he didn't have is, the, you know, four years record, a pandemic, uh, the worst recession or depression since, the, since our last depression in the 20s. Um, and on top of it, he has, and in, forget about Democrats, he has an army of Republicans, uh, you know, running campaigns against him. You know, everything from the Lincoln Project that has just been just just making phenomenal ads that I think we'll, we'll look back in history and see one of the best ads that they've been made um, uh, to various other uh, Republican leaders coming out. And so how do you 
win, right? When you won with the narrowest margin ever, do it again in an environment where your number one issue was the economy. The economy is in a depression, right? Uh, your Republican base that was somewhat pieced together is completely splintered now. Yeah. Right? Um, and your opponent, for all your attempts to try to brand them as a, as a liberal radical socialist, as a radicalist, um, like you said, he is establishment, moderate guy, according to everybody's book, right? He's been in public life for close to 50 years. He's a former vice president. Uh, it's very hard to brand him something he's not because he's just been in the public eye so long. And so if you just, if you take away our PTSD, yeah, right, and you just look at like just sheer math of elections, and Joe Biden's going to take him on election day. The question, though, is what type of election challenges will the president and his allies launch? Before we get to election day itself, right? Uh, because I think that's, I mean, that's a that's a that's an enormous conversation. Um, speaking of Texas, and you're in Texas, obviously, and um, do, do you actually see a scenario where Texas flips this year? Like, is is this the year that Texas can actually flip? Because the polling is so close in Texas right now. The, the polling is close. I think that the Texas House is in play. Um, you know, so if you look, if you kind of move the curtain, kind of see what's going on in Texas, the competitive races in the Texas House are in the suburbs of Dallas, uh, Fort Worth, and Houston. Mm. And the suburbs of those areas, uh, uh, you know, ha have moved. Whereas I know, I know you know a lot about Texas. You, you lived here. Uh, you know, uh, Fort Bend County flipped last time. Uh, places like Sugarland and others that have been just Republican for a long time. Wow. The South Asian County judge, right? Yeah. AP right. Uh, five, four other counties in addition to those flip last time. So we go into presidential cycle. Uh, we're going to see more movement in those suburbs. And so the Texas State House, nine more seats for Democrats. If, if Democrats with nine more seats, flips. And all those nine competitive seats are in, the, in those suburbs. Mm. So we may not see uh, Joe Biden carry Texas. I think the polling indicates it's competitive and there's a chance of that. Uh, but we are likely to see the Texas House flip. And, and the reason why I say that is Beto O'Rourke last, uh, last election cycle lost his um, you know, Senate race against Ted Cruz. By a margin. By just a very thin margin, like you know, right. a few points, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, but he won. Uh, back then, he won the Texas House. So if Democrats won every single race, Beto O'Rourke would have won in the Texas House. Last session, we would have had a Democratic speaker. So the math is there, right? And so there's been an active effort, significant funding uh, for Democrat State House. And so we're likely to see the State House flip. And once you see one branch of government, right? Uh, you have the state house, the state senate, and, and the governor's office, and, and the, the statewide electeds. Once you see one move, then you will see others just kind of follow over the years. Texas won't just become a blue state. Uh, it's kind of like Florida, right? That there is a sense of uh, purple competitiveness around Texas. Every election, yeah. yeah. So I think that w I think we're likely to see in the coming election cycles, Texas be a competitive state. And if Texas is a competitive state, you know, the 38 electoral votes of Texas are up yeah. by either party, right? For Republicans, there is no path to the White House without Texas. Yeah. Yeah. Right? So, yeah, because, I mean, you might not know this, but, I mean, California is going to go Biden. So I've, I've got news for you and a yeah. prediction. Yeah. <laughs> it's, your, it's your keen insight that makes this show really, uh, you know, penetrate. That's why we've been doing this for seven years. Exactly. It's insight like that. So at that point, it would have to be a complete dismantling of the Republican Party as it is today. They'd have to basically hit a reset, right? Restructuring, let's call it. Yeah, yeah. You, you know, look, what what parties are not monolithic, and and they don't they're not top down. They're bottom up at times, right? So it's like telling the Republican Party, "Hey, what you're doing doesn't work. You have to do something differently." Doesn't mean that the Republican primary voters are going to start acting differently just because, right? It's it's just it's not like a professional football team where somebody goes, that game's not working, so let's get rid of this guy, let's get rid of this person, and let's reorganize and, and go win the football game next year. It doesn't work that way, right? Mm -hmm. It is a populist, 
voting system and and that they're going to continue to have a challenge because president trump is a more reflection of the republican primary voters than the republican than you know their reflection of him right i mean yeah he got elected by them and so they're going to continue to look for people like him as we move forward and that's and that's their challenge but you know i i I talk about this, you know, people like me are like, a, you know, perpetually talking, right? Or just as our, this is what we do for a living. Uh, and so when I explain Texas politics to people, the prize of moving Texas is not a, just a partisan game, right? Like right now, when a someone runs from the Democratic Party, they have to come a little bit to the right to get elected to the presidency of the United States. That's why Bernie Sanders doesn't come through, right? It's, it is Joe Biden that always polls better for the general election. Um, if Texas became competitive with 38 electoral votes, then rather than the Democrat coming a little bit to the right to get elected, the Republican nominee would have to come a little bit to the left to get elected. That means that we would change the center of American politics by making Texas competitive. And the, the value of that is not just, you know, red jersey versus blue jersey in the White House, right? The value is that what we talk about changes. If, if Texas becomes competitive, and that means the Republican has to come a little bit to the left to get elected, we no longer have an immigration debate in this country. We will have a comprehensive immigration bill within the first six months of Congress, right? If Texas becomes competitive, we will no longer talk about, like, is health care, Obamacare, or like those debates will fall because we will be more representative of the people in the middle, not the people at the extreme on the right. And that's what we're facing with, right? That moving Texas and making Texas competitive is not just about which party occupies the White House. It's bringing the center of American politics back to what it used to be. A little bit center-right. Yeah. We've always been a center-right country. Yeah. Our politics have just become, you know, much further to the right than anybody can recognize. Well, hey, maybe maybe enough Californians will move to Texas in the next couple of years. Will come uh, on down, matter. <laughs> so it sounds like you're sleeping well at night because of uh, your your forecasted here. Because uh, a lot of the, the picture you're painting says, if not this this election is looking good, and, and future elections are looking even better. Well, yeah, I think, I think it's important for Democrats to realize that this is a center right country. And, and Texas is a center-right state, right? So California, what you're talking about in, in New York, you know, the, the coast, right? They're not more, the Democrats there are not representative right. of Texas. And, it, and it's the same. Texas Republicans, you know, aren't really represented by Republicans in California and New York either, right? They're, so the realignment of politics uh, has to occur you know, reframe itself than what we've had in the last 20, maybe 30 years. Yeah. So I, I guess what's kind of left to talk about, or one of the two things that I really wanted to touch on is let's talk about November 3rd itself. Right. Because I mean, so you, you already created a climate where Trump has stoked these flames and these unfounded claims of mail-in ballot fraud and, uh, and a real refusal to commit to accepting the results of the election and a peaceful transfer of power. Couple that with what some I've heard in the media or political commentators uh, talk about, which is the red mirage scenario, which is that the day of the election, because of um, in-person voting, which is counted first, it it looks like Donald Trump is ahead. But then when you factor in those mail-in ballots, which as I mentioned just a minute ago, you know, is already sort of like, you know, He's he's dispersed, or, or or he's uh, yeah, he's in the validity of what do you see happening on election day? I mean, best best scenario, I think we can all agree, you know, either candidate, you know, Biden obviously, but but wins by a wide enough margin where there's no contestation of the election, right? But but what if outside of that scenario, what do you see happening on election day, election night? Well, I think we're. we're you know, like we've politics has become part of like fantasy football, right? Like we just go, what is the worst case scenario, and how do we deal with it? And what do we, I think you hit, you hit it on the head. The, the best case scenario is people come out, people come out in record numbers. And we don't have a fight, and then we have peaceful transfer of power. Um, 
regardless, I just don't see a scenario in which, you know, President Trump picks up the phone and says, Joe ran a good race. We, you know, went back and forth, but congratulations. And I just don't see that happening under any circumstances. I just don't think President Trump uh, has changed his tune since he's been elected. So he's going to say it's rigged. The question becomes is, is the margin big enough where everybody else says, no, you're done, you're out, right? Uh, <laughs> right. And, and he has done his best effort um, and, and built an apparatus to try to challenge it in different ways. And there's, you know, two or three different counties in Ohio that the, the, the Republicans have launched an election challenge before anybody casted a ballot, right? I mean, so there, there's just a lot of that stuff happening. Yeah. Um, and if it becomes contentious, uh, the hope is that Republicans in the Senate, um, you know, after they've gotten their own shellacking uh, and they've got nowhere else to go, might, you know, build a spine. And we've seen that, you know, Bob Corker, after he left the Senate, uh, built a spine. A um, number of others, I, Trump is in just escapes my name, it escapes my brain right now, the, the other names of senators, but a lot of people that left office post Donald Trump's victory on the Republican side, really started to speak out. And so um, I think the other, other element of it is that President Trump has not really made any friends in the military. In, like, there's nobody backing him, right? I mean, so if the election results are fairly obvious and he's trying to make something uh, up that people just can't see, um, I think the apparatus he's built falls apart. The apparatus gets built because... You pay a team of lawyers to represent your interests. They're representing your interests. Uh, that doesn't mean that they're loyal to you. They're just representing your interests because they're doing a billable hour. Uh, I think that a lot of that apparatus falls apart and, and it's hollow. Uh, and and I think he knows that. And I think he's. I think he has said, uh, you know, that if he loses, uh, he may leave the country. I mean, when's the time you've heard somebody say things like that? Elections rigged. Uh, if I lose, I'll leave the country. I mean, people usually say that, you know, when they, uh, you know, he, he's very transparent in he what is. he thinks, right? Yeah. Like, if you want to know what he thinks, you read his Twitter account, you know what he thinks. He doesn't have a subtle bone in his body. And so, yeah, that's one thing we can we can rely on with Trump. Yeah. So I think, so I, I think the handwriting is on the wall. I think people don't talk about it openly because we have 2016 uh, PTSD. Yeah. Uh, nobody wants to go out and be wrong, but by every metric, he's losing this race and he's losing it big. Uh, and I think that there's, there's fear in saying that because people feel like, well, what if we were wrong? What if we were wrong last time? We were wrong last time for lots of reasons, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so pulling the that off, it was just in the, in the battleground states, we were within the margin of error. Correct. And, uh, and, you know, people put a lot of Russian interference. I just think that the timing, the, 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 you know, the timing and everything just landed perfectly for, for Donald Trump. I mean, he was just a right candidate at the right time with the right opposition in Hillary Clinton. And it just it was, you know, he pulled a straight flush, right? He just, he just pulled it. I mean, he's got a, got a great set of cards and he, he just played it. That doesn't mean that he's some kind of a genius. As you know, it's uh, he's got some political wisdom. It just means that he pulled a straight flush. It's interesting that what he's going to do, you know, whether he, you know, uh, even leaves <laughs> hopefully the uh, the White House, uh, you know, whether he tries to create like an extreme right media empire. What that's interesting, but also the reactions of his supporters. As, you know, assuming he loses, it's going to be interesting. I was it was interesting. I was I was at, I had to go to my house. I was trying to get a service and, and had to meet a, uh, somebody providing a service yesterday. And obviously I hadn't seen the, this person ever in my life or seen a photo. So I met him um, and we were just t talking about timing and so forth. And he said, well, by November 10th, uh, we'll know whether the world's ending or not. And, uh, and I, I kind of looked at him and said, well, you could mean, you could be telling me one of two things about yourself and I won't ask, I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. But um I actually thought to myself, he could be saying as a Republican Trump supporter, the world is ending because the socialist person who is against religion and is incompetent, you know, he could have that argument, but he could also have uh, what the majority of Californians have, which is the, oh my God, if Trump gets elected, he's he's going to be a disaster as well. And, and that just represents to me such the splinter, right, of whoever loses is not going to, if they're in that core 
uh, base of supporters, they're not going to take it well. Yeah, it's the legitimacy of, of the election itself. And that's really what they've attacked. And there is a core following of that. Like, I mean, you've got, you know, the QAnon has got almost 40 candidates around the country, one in Congress, right? Like one about to enter Congress. Uh, so this, uh, this extreme element um, um, within the, uh, the movement is real. Um, they have guns and uh, they're not afraid to ex- you know, assert themselves in this. And I think that's why uh, national security apparatus, what is the FBI or NSA, just, just name, name the alf- alphabet soup in the national security apparatus, are genuinely concerned. There's a genuine concern for this, and and again, we've not we're not alone in this. We've seen uh, a, a neo-Nazi like movement, you know, reemerge in in Germany. Uh, we've seen you know very um, extreme movements uh, in in places like Denmark and and extreme movements out in in, in France. We're seeing this nationalistic uh, movements around the world, and so we are. Exception, right? The the difference with us versus other places, like even UK, right? Is that we have a far more open society. Yeah, you know, we we have an open society that's that's uh, that's very different, and so uh, it, it is. I, I think it's some. It, I think it is legitimate to be concerned about that movement, and it's legitimate to be concerned about the amount of firepower we as Americans have. Um, and we've seen the carnage of that, um, you know, over the years. We've, you know, so it's it's a, uh, it, it, it I, you know, there there is no way around that. It exists. It's there. It's there for the naked eye to see. We just don't acknowledge it and talk about it very much. Yeah, I mean, people have seen it in recent months, right? I mean, how many? Like, because I think I think you're right. There is a there's a mixture of, or, or there's certainly the 2016 PTSD. But that's sort of been exacerbated and coupled by this this sort of thinking out loud about, well, how many Kyle Rittenhouses are there, you know, in, in terms of Trump supporters out there, people like that, who are willing to take to the streets armed and, you know, and, and, and ready to sort of take action. Um, what did he say in the, lack, uh, the last uh, uh, debate was, you know, stand, what does it stand back and uh, yeah, whatever it was. But anyway, yeah. Stand so, by and stand back. Yeah. Thank you. Stand by and stand back. So, yeah, it, it's it's definitely scary. But but like I, I think what you're saying is is, is uh, I, I want to take that kind of optimistic and hopeful note, which is that you know uh, not only is he headed for a loss, he's headed for sort of a, a like a, almost like Biden wins by a landslide, where hopefully some of that can be uh, can be curbed. Um, talking specifically now, as I think. As, uh, among, like, let's say, progressives or Democrats, um, you know, what do you say to the person who is that sort of Bernie supporter or uh, progressive wing of the Democratic Party who's sort of holding his nose and voting Biden because, you know, obviously the alternative, which is Trump, you know, Trump's reelection, you know, presents that sort of existential threat argument that we've heard. Um you know, like Saki, you know, former co-host of the show, you know, one of the things he used to like saying was, you know, the, the like Republicans fall in line and Democrats fall in love. And, and I think that's sort of held true, at least what I've seen. So what is your assessment of Biden as a candidate? You know, really, as someone who values progressive politics and, 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 and where, you know, you have kind of a fracturing within the Democratic Party of, you know, the AOC and uh, you know, Bernie supporters, and then you've got the more establishment types, a la Clinton, Biden, and so on. Look, I just think that there is, I think voters are actually very smart. Uh, you know, they they know there's no perfection. This is a representative democracy. Nobody, you, it's a two-party system. It's a binary choice. And whenever we start going outside of that binary choice, you, know, you can write in anybody's name you want. It's just not going to have any impact. You can vote for a third-party candidate. It's just not going to have any impact. And so people have to – I think voters do come to that con- consensus, and I think especially in this election, 
they, re- they realize that, yeah, you might want Bernie Sanders, but he didn't win the primary. He didn't even get close, right? So you, if you look at the math, it wasn't that somebody thwarted the system. He lost the primary by 4 million votes last time. So there's some real significant numbers. Barack Obama and, and Hillary Clinton had a close primary, uh, but Hillary Clinton and, 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 and Bernie Sanders didn't have a close primary. So it's kind of like what you're saying. If you live in your echo chamber and everybody's saying, uh, you know, this candidate is the one and, and, and they're stealing the election, it just wasn't true, right? Uh, but voters are a lot smarter than we all give you know, ourselves credit for mm-hmm. that there's a group consensus about the, the danger of Donald Trump, right? And there are some people that are never going to leave him. But I think majority of Americans have figured out that there is some real existential danger. Uh, 200 and, you know, almost 30,000 Americans have lost their lives. 8 million people have contracted this virus. Uh, the economy is in deep trouble. Um, our, our national discourse has is, is never been worse. Mm-hmm. Our relations and the division in our society, the fabric of our nation, multiple time on multiple issues has been torn. Uh, and people have just kind of had enough. And so I think that the, I think there's going to be a, a coming together on this. Um, there was a question whether young voters will vote or not. Uh, young voters are voting. It's a question with African-American young men are going to vote or not. And I think come election day, they're going to turn out too. Uh, so all of these things are are more of our fears uh, uh, because we know that, you know, mourning in America looks like Joe Biden taking the oath of office and not seeing Donald Trump on our television. That's what that's what mourning in America looks like, that you're going to turn on the TV, you're not going to see Donald Trump, you're not going to see anybody talk about him, that it will be something that's in our rear view mirror, and we're all going to say, oh, my God, we survived that. Uh, we're, we're ready for, uh, inshallah. for boring. That's yeah, right. yeah, right. Inshallah. Like, I, I love how you borrowed a phrase from Reagan to, to, to kind of <laughs> bring us some news of optimism. Um, I agree. Um so, like, again, staying within the kind of um, – or talking about Biden as a candidate, um, what I'm seeing among Muslims is that for the first time, you know, even within the Muslim community, uh, you, you're, you're beginning to see the kind of fracturing along what we're seeing on a national level, which is you've got voters, Muslim voters, who are very sort of socially conservative, and to them – you know, the whether or not they're going to support a candidate really comes down to those sort of core issues, sorry, social issues, core social issues. Uh, it may not be abortion, number one, but it may be like gay rights, for example, L- L- LGBTQ issues. And then you're seeing other Muslims who uh, are, uh, because we, of what, what I think, what, you know, the eight years of the Bush administration, where Muslims really sort of went towards the more uh, democratic and progressive side of politics. Um, so do you see that play out? And, 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 and if so, what do you say again to the Muslim who says, well, I just can't vote for Biden because of his position on LGBTQ issues, for example? Uh, you, you know, look, um, I mean, I imagine these are conversations no, I, I you've probably no, had. I, think, look, I mean, no, I think it, I think it's, a. Uh, I think people can be flippant about those type of answers, right? Like you can, you can say, that's just stupid, but that's just stupid. And I don't think we should be. I think that people have legitimate concerns um, about their vote. They value that vote. They don't want to give it to the wrong person. They don't want to be supporting someone that may or may not uh, support their values. The question I ask always is, is there anybody in the world that represents everything that you believe in? Right? Because if that's the case, then great. But I just haven't found that person. And we look to history to find prophetic uh, role models. Um, and they don't come in every elected official. And to create that type of a litmus test on anybody, you, you're always going to be disappointed. Yeah. You live in a two-party system. You pick the best person that that 
fits the time and your values at the at at, at when it's given. It's it's a choice, right? It, it's a, it's a choice, and so this notion of like, well, I can't ever do X or I can't ever do Y. Uh, you know, it's like I will uh, uh, never, I mean, this is a very bad example. I will never eat pork. Well, you know, if that's the only thing in life and there's nothing else left, you, she, your, your faith gives you permission to go do so, right? And so there is a tradition uh, and there's scripture that says follow the rules or, and laws of where you live, be part of your community, know your neighbors, uh, you know, participate in that society, adhere to your values. And I think you can certainly do that. But whenever you get rigidness, that I can't do X because, you know, then you know that someone is trying to impose their values on someone else. And there is no compulsion in faith. Mm -hmm. Make somebody do something, right? And so it's like you live your values as you can you in, in your family. And uh, there are some things that, you may not agree with other people on, but the alternative a lot of times now is somebody who's a white nationalist. It's a QAnon candidate or, or it's a, somebody who, you, you know, uh, it wants to vote for a Muslim ban or a whole lot of other things. Right. So I think I think we have to be far more open in our thinking mm -hmm. uh, and realize that you can't start putting these type of rigidness and and feel when you do as if that's pious and holy, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, because anytime you get that, that there is a sense of arrogance that comes with that. And we all have to fight that, that when you say this person is wrong and this is why they're, your judgment of that person says a lot about you as much as about them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So sort of the, yeah, I mean, I, and I agree with you. It's, 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 it's it, and I can even hear it in the way you're describing it. Look for it's all, it's, it's like, if I can translate it, what you're saying, which is, look, like it or not, we've got a two party system. You've got candidates that are not going to be perfect. And, you know, you have to make an assessment based on what values that you that, that you consider important or more important than others. And, and so sort of the quintessential kind of real politique kind of calculus there. Right. Political um, realism. Absolutely. And, 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 and the day people start saying, I'm just going to walk out of this office because I don't like my boss. He doesn't reflect my values. I'm, I'm game with them to follow that right to the poll. But there's a lot, pe a lot of things people swallow. Yeah. Like living to do a lot of other things. So true. When it comes to your vote, you just become really holy. Right. So I think. Yeah. That's that's element of it. We should just be. It's not that we should be practical. Right. Yeah. It should be. We should live in the real world when it comes to politics, just like we do. We live in the real world when it comes to so many other things. Right. Just, and so it doesn't mean that you don't follow your faith. Truly. It doesn't mean that you don't pray. It doesn't mean that none of those things. You can do all of those things. You can with, work within the framework, but you have to work within the framework to make society better where you are. You have yeah. to be part of the system to change the system. So it's, it's perfectly fine to be a populist, but be a populist in a liberal democracy. Uh, being a populist uh, in an authoritarian regime is just not going to work out for you. Good point. Good point. Um, yeah. And, and I mean, I think so we're, like, again, as someone like yourself, who I know personally, you've been involved in the Muslim community, having these kind of conversations for 20, 30 years. I don't want to date you or myself, but um, it, you know, it, it is true. Um, do you feel that the Muslim community has matured? You know, are they, are they willing to have these conversations or do you feel that we're still, relatively anemic when it comes to understanding politics, because like, at least from, I mean, if I'm, if I put on my cynical hat, wh what I've seen is, you know, like 30 years ago, we used to talk about, well, this is what the Jewish community does. And this is what the Jewish community has done. Right. Well, the Jewish community has, has, has moved on and, and we're still, you know, sort of having that, those same conversations that we were having 20 to 30 years ago. And in fact, what we've seen happen uh, more recently is even a community like the Hindu community. Um, and again, this was a conversation I wanted to have uh, about sort of a lot of the sort of candidates that we're seeing, like right there in Texas, you've got Kulkarni and some of the, some of the, uh, some of the uh, um, uh, controversy around whether or not, you know, he's pro Modi or not, but, but maybe we can save that for another day is I, I feel like other communities that were junior to us, like even 20 years ago have really matured politically and yet we're still sort of like stuck where we were 20 years ago in terms of our uh, maturity level 
grass is always greener on the other side, right? Like, <laughs> like the, the name of my firm is Outreach Strategist. So we work in a lot of different ethnic communities. And what I find is people always think that they're unique, but they're really not. You know, it's a human condition to argue with each other. It's a human condition to, to hold the people that are in your community at a higher standard. Not, not necessarily bad. It just means it's just what it is, right? Like you just, you expect more from each other, so to speak, right? And so I think that, um, the the most the, the the average Muslim, like an average Christian or average Jewish American or average whatever, gets up in the morning, goes to work, comes back home, plays with their kids, tries to, you know, do the best they can, goes to bed, starts in the morning, starts all over again. There's a few people that argue with each other about esoteric issues um, and faith and politics. Those people haven't changed. They do argue about the same stuff over and over again. But the vast majority of the public just gets up the morning, wants to go to bed at night, and 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 basically want better for their kids than they've had it. And that just is kind of like the American story, right? So I think the Muslim community is no different. That most Muslims aren't in these esoteric conversations. <laughs> uh, they just they're they're looking to make a living and make a better life for their kids and. You know, uh, they look at politics uh, just like everybody else does as a team sport. Uh, they might wear a blue jersey. They may wear a red jersey. Uh, they're protagonists within the community uh, that argue about this point or that point. But 90% of the community is on a completely different track. There's a small minority of the people. And, and just like every community, there's a small minority of people that like debate for the sake of debate. And, and again, I'm, I'm one of those. So I'm not being just about I like debate for the debate. I want to know more about the issue. I want to represent a particular viewpoint and I want to argue about it, right? But most people are kind of like, you know, where's dinner? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm that sorry. Trump guy off my television. I don't think he likes people like me, right? I mean, that's just, you know, and, it, and that's, I think that's the reality that we all live in. There's a sense of self-importance when we do these arguments. And, 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 and having said that, those are the people that also move the society forward, right? Those are the people that push for change. Uh, and, and so I, I think the debate is healthy and I think it's strong and it's vibrant. Uh, and I think that we should foster more of it. Mm. We should have more people, going into the Republican Party and being Republicans. We'd have more people going to Democratic, be, be Democrats. We'd have more people, you know, uh, you know, pushing the envelopes about this debate of which party we should be on. Because that dialogue is what I think makes our community, the Muslim American community, the, the, the richest in the world, right? The, the ability to argue with each other in an open environment, uh, the ability to say, you're wrong, but you're still family, so you can sit next to me, but I get the chicken. Uh, you know, like, I mean, just just that that tension, right, that dialogue, writing our opinions, talking about them, having a podcast, that is, that is what our faith tr- teaches us in how we evolve and get better. So, yeah. And, and, and I think it keeps politicians for their part or, or for the most part on their toes. Like they won't take us for granted as a community, right? I mean, they know they have to earn our vote and we're not just going to vote for them because they have a D after their name or an R after their name. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I would say yes. And I would say the other part is, you know, what really cuts through in the political circles of relationship. I know you, you, you like me, you support me. I want to hear what you have to say because you're my constituent, you're my donor, you're my friend. It's no different in any other space, right? Like, you know, people have these kind of like wild type of, uh, 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 you know, uh, understanding of the political process. At the end of the day, uh, a political person is a human being. And if a friend is in need and they can see through their eyes, I'll end with this story, you know, when our time's coming up. Uh, Norm Mineta was was in the White House, uh, standing with with President Trump uh, when 9/11 was occurring, and there was a decision that had to be made. Uh, and President Trump, uh, there was this question: Do we round people up? Do we hold people? Do we do these type of things? And President Trump looked at Norm Mineta and said, "I'm not going to let happen to what happened to your family happen to other people." And Norm Mineta was grew up. 
uh, and spend time in Japanese uh, 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 camps in the United States uh, during World War II. And he had grown up with that sentiment that this is wrong and it shouldn't happen. And Normanetta was the Secretary of Transportation, and FAA was under the Secretary, uh, Secretary of Transportation. So when they brought the planes down, when they, he was in the room making those decisions with President Trump, and his presence there made the difference in some of the biggest decisions that impacted the Muslim community and President Trump, right? Because in that sense, he was looking into the eyes of someone who grew up in a camp, and that person's worldview was represented in that table. And so I tell people, you know, in the community, it's not Republican, it's not Democrat, it's not, you know, uh, um, any of those things. It's like your engagement, your involvement, your encouragement of others to be involved and engage is what's valuable to the community. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much. You know, you've made some great points uh, about the next 12 days and what's going to happen post November 3rd. But what I really appreciate is you're going to give us something to think about uh, longer term as Muslim citizens, as Muslim voters, and how we should just approach the whole the whole topic of politics and citizen citizenship. So really appreciate it. Uh, we're, we've gone over an hour. Um, and uh, I want to let you get back to dinner and your family. Uh, but Really huge thanks from us for the for the great conversation. Uh, before we wrap, we always want to hear from our, our guests about projects they're working on. Obviously, you have a consulting firm. Um, tell us a little more about that and, and how people can can get in touch. Well, I, I would say, uh, you know, I, I am on the board of an of a organization called Olive Branch in Houston. And, and we are... Um, We've created well, the equivalent of Jewish family services and Muslim family services, nice. uh, doing case management work um, and and trying to uplift the the larger Muslim community. I think we live in a bubble that says Muslim Muslims are, are doing really great when the reality is they're not. Uh, and so this element of social service and connecting uh, the people from our faith into resources that are available as well as providing resources, especially during this COVID era. So as you think about your your zakat dollars, I would tell people spend it locally, spend it where you live, because there's a there's an enormous need, and don't um, don't think that the the Muslim Americans that that occupy uh, this country and are part of your 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 um, uh, you know your your Muslim family are the same as the ones that are on your cell phone. Uh, they're not. Uh, there's a great need. Uh, especially right now. So spend your zakat house. We're coming to a year end and people are going to make uh, charitable contributions. Right. Your local organizations and step up. Like those that have it have to step up above and beyond what you've ever done because no one's lived through a depression before. Many of us just have not fathomed that. So there are people that are losing their homes, they're losing their livelihoods at a record number. And if you're fortunate uh, that you have it, then I think it's time to start spending more of it with, with others that don't. Thank you. And I think that's a wonderful note to end on. Uh, I think both Omar and I would probably get doxxed if we didn't mention, if, if we didn't mention the fact that, uh, it, you know, Mustafa is family. Um, his wife is related to both of us. Uh, and so we want to do definitely give a shout out to uh, our extended family out there. And uh, actually uh, Mustafa and I are also sort of related uh, through the, sort of Hyderabadi grapevine, as it, as it were, or Hyderabadi sort of relations. But uh, yeah, we're definitely all family. But thank you so much. Uh, as, as And I want to echo everything Omar said. Um, last bit of thing, or, or one last thing I wanted to mention to our listeners as we wrap is uh, on the last episode, I mentioned um, a, uh, a movie that's on Netflix called The Trial of the Chicago 7. Um, I wanted to highly recommend, you know, if you have Netflix, definitely watch it. Um, there is kind of a Muslim connection because the, uh, the title, you know, title 10 of the civil rights act that, that the defendants are actually being charged with, uh, came to be known as the rap Brown law. And it's, it's, it's named after H rap Brown, who many Muslims probably know is Imam Jamil al Amin, who unfortunately, you know, one can Google his name if you're not familiar and um, unfortunately, you know, kind of a real sad story of Imam Jamil al Amin, but you can definitely find out about that. But it's a great, very timely movie. Um, definitely catch it. Like the, the sort of parallels to what's happening right now are unmistakable. But if you have a chance, definitely uh, check that out. And I was really, like I said, kind of, 
uh, I didn't realize the sort of immediate sort of connection to the Muslim community as well. But um, thank you, Mustafa, uh, again. Um, and thank you for taking the time to get on the show. Um, listeners, if you want to reach out to us with feedback, comment, thoughts, questions, um, you know, you can email us at diffusecongruence at gmail.com. And you can uh, hit us up on Facebook or Twitter. So thank you so much, as always, for listening. And we'll see you on the other side of the election. Stay safe and get out there and vote. Go vote. I'm <laughs> <laughs>